for that. Uh, at this time, I will yield the floor. I see my colleague here, and at his conclusion, I will pick back up with the two and a half additional hours that I have reserved. The senator from Kentucky. President, I'm not a big fan of foreign aid. We have a lot of problems in our country, and I just don't see how we can send billions of dollars overseas when we've got bridges that are falling down in our country. Two bridges in my state were impassable. One was hit by a boat and has been impassable for six months. We have another bridge that's over 50 years old and was shut down for emergency repairs and traffic stacked up for miles. And yet we send billions of dollars overseas when we don't have enough to fix our own bridges. It doesn't make any sense. We borrow a trillion dollars a year from China simply to turn around and send it to some other country. It makes no sense. I'm not a big fan of sending your money overseas, but I'm even less a fan of sending your money to countries who don't seem to be our friends. Now, Pakistan has worked with us on the war on terror, but recently Pakistan has chosen not to let any of our supplies, our food and uh, military supplies to traverse Pakistan. Recently, Pakistan has said we owe them $3 billion. We're giving them $2 billion a year, and they say we are back. We owe them $3 billion that's not even included in that. Recently, Pakistan has also said they want to charge us $5,000 per container of food that goes across their land. And for years, bin Laden lived contentedly right in the middle of Pakistan underneath their noses. So what's up with that? We're giving Pakistan $2 billion a year, and bin Laden's just twiddling his thumbs there. They're not letting our supplies go across. They're demanding a past payment of $3 billion for who knows what, and we continue to pay them. Recently, it's gotten even worse. Dr. Shaquille Afridi is a doctor who helped us get bin Laden. Now, I don't know how his name became public. Somehow his name was leaked. Somebody leaked his name. And I don't know whoever leaked the name if they were trying to puff themselves up and make them look like they were strongly fighting terrorism, but by leaking his name, he's now in prison for 33 years. Dr. Shaquille Afridi is a Pakistani who helped us get bin Laden. The Pakistani government has put him in prison for 33 years. His life has been threatened. If he is released, which I hope he will be released, his life has been threatened and he's in danger because his name is public. How did his name become public? Somebody leaked his name. This is inexcusable. If this came from within our government, whoever leaked his name or leaked this information needs to be held accountable. I mean put in prison in our country for leaking state secrets. The thing is, is his name is now known in public and he is threatened. His family is threatened. But not only that, anybody around the world who wants to help us to stop terrorism around the world, who's willing to stand up and say, I will help America, they are now threatened. Do you think people are going to want to help us if they know their name's going to be printed in the New York Times? We have to have things that we do not divulge about people who are helping us to combat terrorism. Dr. Afridi is now in prison for 33 years, and I'm going to do what I can to free him. What I'm saying is we shouldn't send him any more money. I say stop immediately. I'm not saying take a small amount next year. Don't send him one more penny this year or next year. Don't send him any of the $3 billion they want. One, we don't even have it to send to him. We've got to borrow it from China to send to him. Don't send him another penny. But I'm giving them one chance to get out. If they'll release Dr. Afridi, I'll stand down. Now, my bill was blocked. I tried to have a vote on this last week, and the leadership here said, no, you won't have that vote. But we have a process where if you get enough signatures from senators, you can ask for a vote and get it. That's where we are now. I have enough signatures to have the vote. I'm going to be meeting with the Pakistani ambassador. I'm going to be meeting with President Obama's State Department. And what I will tell them is what I'm telling you. This is not a secret. If Dr. Afridi is not successful with his appeal, which is coming up in the next three weeks, if he is not released and provided safe passage out of Pakistan if he wishes, then I'll have this vote. And I defy anyone in this body to stand up here and vote to send U.S. taxpayer dollars to Pakistan when they're treating us this way. 
So we will have a vote in this body on ending all aid to Pakistan immediately if we don't get some results. Now, this doesn't mean I don't want to have diplomacy with Pakistan. Pakistan has been a friend over many years, and I see no reason to end that. Pakistan has many elements who are uh, pro-Western and are, do want to engage in the world. I'm all for that. But you shouldn't have to buy your friends. You shouldn't have to pay a ransom. You shouldn't have to lavish them with taxpayer dollars. In fact, I think it, treat, it encourages a disrespect when you give people so much money. Let's let them earn our respect. Let's work with them. Let's be friends with Pakistan. Let's have diplomatic ties to Pakistan. Let's try to help each other. Terrorism doesn't help Pakistan. They're threatened equally by it. I can list four Pakistani leaders who have been assassinated in the last 15 years. Why are they assassinated? Because of radical elements in their own country. So they should be with us on trying to stop extremism, on trying to stop this radicalism. So my words for the Senate today and for the American people are, is that I'm watching out for your money. I realize that we have needs here at home that must come first, but also that I will force a vote on this, and I'm not going to send any more of your money or try not to let the Senate send any of your money to Pakistan unless they're willing to cooperate, unless they're willing to be friends with America, unless they're willing to release the man who helped us get bin Laden. So I will ask for a vote. It will come in the next few weeks, and I will keep everyone in America up to date on this, and I thank the Senate for allowing me this time and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Cook. Senator from North Carolina. Mr. President, I ask that the quorum call be officiated. Um, uh, without, um, oh my goodness, um, I thank, without I, objection. I thank the President. <laughs> Mr. President, I uh, thank uh, Senator Paul for relinquishing uh, the mic and uh, just for the purposes of members who are planning, uh, I, th I think we'll be about another hour and I'll, we'll, we'll know shortly, and I'll, I'll put that word out uh, if, in fact, that's going to be the case, but I intend to make sure that everybody's able to make a 5 o'clock briefing. And I've spent the first hour talking about the FDA user fee agreement bill, a history of it, what this bill did, uh, and a lot about how this bill came up short. I'd like to jog in a few different directions over the next period of time, if I can of great interest to me and great interest to a lot of members is the commitment that we owe to our nation's military heroes. Over four decades ago, at one of the two Marine Corps bases in America, Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina, they experienced serious contamination of its water. That contamination is likely the worst environmental exposure incident on a domestic military installation in the history of the country. Both in the magnitude of the population potentially exposed to volatile organic solvents and the duration of the contamination estimated to be 30 years or longer. Hundreds of thousands of veterans, their families, along with civilian workers, cycled through Camp Lejeune from the busy years of World War II through the Vietnam conflict and into the mid-80s as we rebuilt our modern military. During these decades, unbeknownst to the base residents, the wells feeding the water supply on the base were drawing water from an aquifer contaminated with industrial chemicals that were dumped on the base, like the degreasing solvent, TCE, 
a known human carcinogen. Another carcinogen, benzene, from leaking underground fuel storage tanks, along with the dry cleaning solvent, solvent PCE, and a third human carcinogen, vinyl chloride. The Navy and Marine Corps began to test some of the base wells in the 1980s to comply with federal regulations and apparently to also locate the source of various contaminations. Yet it would take several more years and numerous warning signs before the Navy finally decided it should shut the wells down in 1985 through 1987. As we know now, the Navy and Marines had specific regulations on their own to maintain safe drinking water and test for contaminants. Had they adhered to their regulation, the many years of problems at Camp Lejeune might have been avoided. It's also important to note that the source of those contaminations should never have been in question since Lejeune's drinking water was then and is now solely derived from the wells located within the perimeters of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. In 1989, the EPA designated Camp Lejeune a Superfund site, and in 1991, the CDC, via its Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, or ASTDR, began a statutorily mandated study of the contamination. Those studies continue to this day, in large part because the Navy's records of the contamination were not completely turned over to the ATSDR until 2009 and 2010. Scientists at the ATSDR and others involved in its review of the Navy's records have stated that the levels of certain contamination, contaminants recorded in well samples taken by the Navy were at such high levels that they have never been seen before and in many cases they far exceed what we now consider to be safe levels for drinking water. Well, the Veterans Administration is awarding disability benefits to Lejeune veterans on a case-by-case -case basis today. But that's a slow and unpredictable process while many are suffering without adequate health care. It's my hope that in the coming weeks we will finally pass critical legislation in this Congress to require the VA to take care of the veterans and their family members. Many of them are ill from exposure related conditions and have no other means of getting health care. They are rightly looking to the VA and to the Congress for help. If we can get this legislation passed, it will be a starting point on the road to doing the right thing for those who have sacrificed so much for our nation. I just think it's absolutely a crime that now, some 40 years later, we haven't even completed the studies that we need to to understand the severity of the problems that we have. I might add that some of the service members and some of the family members that served at Camp Lejeune during this time uh, are no longer with us. So it's hard to reconstruct exactly why, but I can assure you when you have some estimate ten times the number of male breast cancer cases from people that lived on that base during that time, one might conclude that it was a hot spot based upon its drinking water. My hope is that this Congress will move forward with a very small initial step, but also make a commitment to these family members and service members to not quit until we do the right thing. Mr. President, this week the Supreme Court's going to rule on the President's health care law. You'd have to live under a rock not to realize that it's going to happen Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. We have waited patiently every time the Supreme Court has rolled out uh, their announcement for the last uh, three weeks, I think, of cases that they had decided as the court comes to the end of their summer business. Two years ago, then Speaker Nancy Pelosi told Americans, and I quote, we have to pass the bill so that we can find out what's in it. We have to pass the bill so we can find out what's in it. It seems fitting uh, that we stop and take stock of what 
the American people have learned about the president's health care law over the past two years. American people uh, have found they can't afford the president's health care law. The Medicare chief actuary, in his final estimate of the health care law, projected that will, it will increase health care spending across the economy by $311 billion. Now, that's a 10-year number. But understand that the president promised that the health care law would reduce cost. It wasn't a goal. He promised it would reduce costs. Unfortunately, it's made things worse by increasing health care costs. And I think that the Medicare chief actuary is probably a very conservative estimate of an increase of $311 billion. Growth in, growth in the U.S. health care spending will almost double by 2014 due to the president's new law. Now, this is at a time where we already are in a situation where it's financially unsustainable on the path that we're on. The predictions of the president's health care law increasing insurance premiums are already being felt by the American people. Depending upon where you live, depending upon who your employer is, depending upon whether you buy your own insurance, depends on how hard you've been hit. But there's nobody in America that has not seen their premium go up since Congress passed this health care bill that was supposed to reduce the cost of health care. The Congressional Budget Office estimated that the new law will increase health insurance premiums by 10 to 13 percent. This means a family purchasing coverage on their own will have to pay $2,100 a year more because of the President's health care law. And by the way, 10 to 13 percent is what many Americans have felt as an increase on an annual basis. New taxes. New taxes on life-saving drugs, devices, and health plans. Now think about that with the hour I just finished. I just talked about the fact that Congress needs to be focused on the efficiencies of government, how we bring innovative products, devices, pharmaceuticals, biologics, generics to the marketplace, and embedded into Obamacare are new taxes on drugs, devices, and health plans. American people hadn't felt this yet at a time that we're supposed to be passing legislation to bring down health care costs. Not only does the Congressional Budget Office say this is going to increase the premium cost, not only does the President's chief actuary, CMS is under the, the, the executive side of government, it's not under Congress's authority, he said that the health care spending across the economy um, based upon the health care law is $311 billion. We have yet to kick in the new taxes on life-saving drugs, devices, and health plans, which will drive up consumer cost and additionally drive up premium cost. Just after passage of the new law in May 2010, the director of the Congressional Budget Office said, rising, and I quote, rising health costs will put tremendous pressure on the federal budget. In CBO's judgment, the health legislation enacted earlier this year does not substantially diminish that pressure. The question is, what were we thinking? And now we've got the court to decide whether this is constitutional or not. CBO's latest long-term fiscal outlook notes that the spending on health care has been growing faster than the economy for many years, posing challenges for Medicare, Medicaid, state and local governments, and the private sector. You know, sometimes this is missed by members of Congress and our constituents. Um, there's a tremendous cost that we shift to the states and the local governments, depending upon how they share in the Medicaid uh, state obligations for cost sharing, uh, where states are picking up a tremendous 
amount of additional cost because of the passage of the President's health care plan. Because we're doubling, through legislation, we're doubling the amount of people that are on Medicaid. So now you're going to get hit by the increase in your insurance premium. You're going to get hit by the increase in overall health care costs. You're going to get hit by the new taxes on life-saving drugs, devices, health care plans. And, oh, by the way, you're going to get hit in your state taxes because of the increased burden of Medicaid beneficiaries who are in part funded by the state and are going to now require states to find new ways to raise revenue, which is typically through our state taxes. CBO's, uh, uh, CBO's right to conclude that such rates of growth cannot continue indefinitely because total spending on health care would eventually account for all the country's economic output, which CBO concludes, and I quote, is an impossible outcome. Well, Madam President, we need real reform that actually lowers cost, not increases cost. We need real policy that institutes better outcomes, not rationing of care. And the American people need to look at what the President promised when he created this legislation. He promised that if you like your plan, you get to keep it. Unfortunately, the administration has estimated that up to 69% of all the businesses could lose the ability to keep what they have as a result of the administration's grandfather health plan regulation. The former director of the CBO, Doug Holtzegen, warned that the law, and I quote, provides strong incentive for employers and their employees to drop employer-sponsored health insurance for as many as 35 million Americans. Well, if an employer drops their health care coverage, how can the employee ch uh, uh, cash in on the president's promise to keep what he's got? Millions of seniors will lose access to their Mer Medicare Advantage plans. Now, I'm not quite there but some of my colleagues have reached that magical number. Uh, do seniors not deserve choice? Is, is that what it is? Do we just want to give them one thing and no choice? And the truth is we, cre we, uh, we allowed, we didn't create, the private sector created. We allowed the private sector to create Medicare choice years ago. And for many seniors, they chose to take the private sector product. Why? Because it provided more coverage to them. It provided preventative care. They actually got covered physicals every year. Um, in many cases, they didn't have co-payments. In many cases, their prescriptions were covered long before we created Part D Medicare. So what's the President's health care plan do? It tightens the requirements on Medicare Advantage to the point that some seniors who are on it today will lose it because it's no longer an option in the markets they live in. How in the world can you do that and make a promise that if you like it, you get to keep it? Health plans offered by religiously affiliated organizations will be compelled to offer products that violate the tenets of their faith a new mandate that jeopardizes employees' existing coverage and infringes on religious liberty. Well, uh, that's going into a ground we've never gone into. And I think there is a reason that we've allowed people to hold to the moral standards that they felt were important. Then Speaker of the House Pelosi said that the health care law will create 4 million jobs, 400,000 jobs almost immediately. Yet the director of the Congressional Budget Office testified that the new law will reduce employment over the next decade by 800,000 jobs. Think about that. 
Then Speaker Pelosi said, 4 million jobs, 400,000 just almost immediately. And the CBO director testifies we're going to lose 800,000. That's a difference of 4.8 million jobs in America. The president said that he was, gonna, that he was not going to touch Medicare. Uh, we heard that over and over again. He said to seniors, I'm not going to touch Medicare. He'd already taken Medicare Advantage away as a, cho as a choice, but he wasn't going to touch Medicare. The law took more than $500 billion out of Medicare. A health care plan that today is not financially sustainable, and the president in his health care legislation shifted $500 billion out of Medicare, not to put Medicare on a sustainable path, but to fund new government programs the American people could not afford. Arbitrary cuts to providers that jeopardize access to care will not put Medicare on a sustainable path for current and future retirees. What does that mean? Doctor cuts. We cut the reimbursement to doctors. We cut the reimbursements to hospitals. We've now got doctors that won't see Medicare beneficiaries. If you're 65 and you move to Raleigh, North Carolina, the likelihood is you're not going to find a primary care doc that's going to take you if you're on Medicare. To that person, to that senior, that's rationing. I don't care how you say it. And the reality is this bill caused that. The president promised no family making less than $250,000 a year will see any form of tax increase. Well, I just covered a second ago the new health care law is riddled with new taxes and penalties that directly fall on the middle class and will harm small businesses. New taxes on life-saving drugs, devices, health plans, they're all going to be passed on to consumers. You can't, it's disingenuous to say that everybody in the system is not going to feel the effects of taxes. They may not be directly on you, but they are on the products that constitute our health care system. We should be advancing policies that help small business to thrive in America, not policies that increase health care costs, policies that encourage innovators to export innovation and good-paying jobs overseas. We should be advancing policies that focus on helping to get our economy back on track. Unfortunately, the president's health care law does just the opposite. According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce survey on small business, 74% of small businesses said that the health care spending law makes it harder, harder for their firms to hire new workers. 30% said they're not hiring due to the law. There's only one issue in America. How do we get the American people back to work right now? How do we turn this economy around? You know, we can have all the cuts you want to have from a standpoint of spending, but unless we're willing to put Americans back to work and get them productive in, in, in participating in the revenue collection of this country, we're not going to get on a pathway to financial sustainability. This country wasn't created because people came here and said, let's create a place called America where everything's free. It was created as an area of unlimited opportunity. And that's why millions a year come here for unlimited opportunity, not for unlimited handouts. When de Tocqueville left the United States, he talked about the greatest country in the world. And he defined it this way, the capacity of the American people to give of their time and their resources for people who were in need. He never mentioned state or federal government. He talked about a responsibility of the American people to help somebody that was down on their luck, hungry, homeless. And you know what? For those of us that are adults, it's our responsibility to set the example for the next generation to come up and assume the same individual responsibility. But now it seems like all we talk about is legislation that inserts the federal government or the state government or the local government in the place of what historically made this country great, which was our willingness 
to assume the responsibility ourselves. Let me just assure you, we shouldn't be surprised that the results of the assessment of health care, of the government running health care, mean job loss, increased cost. We've got to make sure that we provide more choice, not less choice. We've got to get the American people engaged in negotiating their health care cost, not letting the federal government negotiate your health care cost. I came here for the first time 18 and a half years ago. I worked for a company of 50 employees. I came to the United States House of Representatives and chose the same plan in Winston-Salem, North Carolina I had with that small employer. The only difference was that when I got here, the federal government paid 75 percent, my employer paid 75 percent. I paid 25 percent here, I paid 25 percent there. I got exactly the same plan, the same coverage, everything was identical. When I left Winston-Salem to become a member of the United States House of Representatives, my cost of that health care plan was $105. When the federal government got through negotiating my same health care plan, it went up to $160. I knew on day one I did not want the federal government negotiating my health care because it meant higher prices and no change in coverage. The reality is that I think many Americans have realized that about Obamacare today. And my hope and my plea and my prayers are that Thursday the Supreme Court nullifies this bill and this Congress is challenged with going back and step by step or in comprehensive fashion, we write a health care bill that includes the participation of the American people, puts responsibility on everybody. Everybody in America should have the responsibility to pay something when they go into access. It doesn't matter whether it's private insurance, it doesn't matter whether it's Medicare, it doesn't matter whether it's Medicaid. If we want to financially solve the hole we're in in this country, then we've got to income test everything that comes out of the federal government. That means people that have more pay more. It means people that have less pay something. But we've got to be a country of unlimited opportunity and not of an unlimited handouts. A February 2012 Gallup survey found that 48% of small businesses are not hiring because of the potential cost of health care. Studies indicate that the laws innovative tax killing on medical devices could cost an additional 43,000 jobs in America. The President's health care uh, uh, bill is the wrong prescription for America. Regardless of the Supreme Court's decision this week, it's clear we must advance common sense sustainable reforms that actually fulfill the promise to lower health care costs. Without that, America will, should be outraged, and I believe will be outraged. Now, Madam President, uh, also in the news in the last several weeks is an issue that uh, is somewhat personal to me as a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, as a former member of the House Intelligence Committee, as one who has dealt with the work of the Intelligence Committee since the year 2000, and as one who lived up close and personal everything that has happened since 9-11, we've seen an incredible spree of security leaks. Leaks of classified and sensitive information. You know, I go home on the weekends and there'll be a news report on something and my wife will look at me and she said, why is this reported? There's no reason for the American people or for anybody in the world to know about that. Well, I can tell you, it wasn't that long ago that even if the press found out, they'd never print it. Today, routinely, there are leaks of classified and sensitive information. Recently, there's been a series of articles published that have described, in some cases, in extreme detail, highly classified unilateral and joint intelligence operations. I'm not talking about 
suggesting that it might be there or without detail. I'm talking about specifics of what happened. To describe these leaks as troubling and frustrating is an understatement. They are inexcusable by whoever. Our intelligence professionals, our allies, and most importantly, the American people deserve better than what they've seen over the last several weeks. I'm personally sick and tired of reading articles about sensitive operations that quote current and former U.S. officials, individuals who were briefed on the discussion, officials speaking on condition of anonymity to discuss the clandestine programs, a senior American officer who received classified intelligence reports, according to participants in the program, according to officials in the room, and individuals who none of would allow their name to be used because the effort remains highly classified and parts are to, of it continue today. That's the basis. That's the basis that these front page stories run on. And I'm not confirming or denying that anything in it is accurate or inaccurate. Because as a member of the committee, I sign an obligation that says, no covert action will I even comment on. Any person that holds secret compartmentalized clearance has an obligation to never acknowledge the existence of a program. Well, I asked not long ago, was the drone program still a classified program? The answer I got was yes. But the White House press secretary for the last three weeks has stood at the podium and talked about drone attacks on a program that I technically cannot go out and acknowledge either exists or it doesn't. Our freedom with understanding that politics trumps security has reached a new level. It's got to stop, and it's got to stop now. The un unauthorized disclosure of classified intelligence at best violates trust and potentially damages vital liaison relationships, and at worst, it gets people killed. Clandestine operations are often, as I wrote with Senator Coates and Rubio in the Washington Post, highly per perishable, and they depend on hundreds of hours of painstaking work and the ability to get foreigners to trust our government. I strongly believe that these leakers are also violating the trust of the most important constituency of all, the American people. Even more troubling is that there appears to be a pattern that these stories and leaks, they may be designed to make the administration look good on national security. It used to be that the good stuff was buried by the media and the worst was run. Not anymore. Truth be told, rarely have I seen a story that paints this administration in a bad light. Then when we're about to, the administration invokes executive privilege. They can do that. That's okay. But there's a big difference between invoking executive privilege on not producing documents for Fast and Furious and releasing classified information that puts at risk individuals who are embedded in terrorist organizations who are doing their job to keep America safe. This has crossed the line. I wish this administration was as concerned about preventing leaks of classified information as it is about keeping a lid on the information Congress is asking for. As a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, I understand firsthand the grave importance of keeping information secure. The unauthorized and reckless disclosure of classified information undermines the hard work of our intelligence officers and put li puts lives at risk. And it jeopardizes our relationship with overseas partners. Congress's intelligence oversight committees will not tolerate, nor should the American people. So quite simply, I come to the floor today to deliver a message to those individuals who were briefed on the discussions, who were part of the program, who were in the room, who are speaking on condition of anonymity, stop talking. 
Whatever agenda you have, I can assure you that it's not worth the damage that you're causing and the lives you're putting at risk. We cannot continue to tolerate leaks at any level or branch of government. Now, my colleagues and I are considering every available legislative option to ensure the security of the intelligence community operations and the people who support them. If you have access to classified information and are tempted to leak that information for whatever reason, I ask you to remind yourself that you may be hurting and what trust you're violating. And more importantly, keep your mouth shut. The Intelligence Committee on both sides of the Hill, I think, will take action in their authorization bill to try to address a structure that brings a new level of oversight and hopefully prosecution to those who choose to leak secrets. In the interim, I'm still considering the fact that for any person who openly talks about a program that is secret or compartmentalized, that the day they say one word about that program, they lose their top secret clearance. I'd love to see them lose their pension, but I understand how problematic that is. But at least we can stop the bleeding by taking away their access to the conversations or the meetings that they happen to be a participant in or they happen to, or happen to be entrusted with the information in a fashion that allows them to go out and publicly talk about that and jeopardize the lives of Americans, the lives of our partners, and more importantly, the security of the American people. Madam President, on August 5, 2011, Standard & Poor's downgraded the credit rating of the United States for the first time in our history. And they cited out-of-control debt and lack of a serious plan to address it as its main reason. Nearly a year later, the administration's done nothing to remedy this problem. As a matter of fact, sometime at the end of this year, we're going to run out of our ability to borrow money. It's called the debt ceiling. And I can't tell you today, because we're not told whether that's going to happen in October, November, December, January, but it doesn't go much past the end of the first of the year. And I sort of pity the next president, whoever that is. They're probably going to get inaugurated one day, and the next day they're going to have to come to Congress and ask for a $3 trillion increase to the national debt. And as difficult as it is for me to say, we're going to have to do it. The country has to have the capacity, the capabilities to borrow money to function. But you would think that with this all known, we'd take the opportunity now to begin to change the grotesque spending habits, to begin to prioritize the investments that we make, that we would attempt to reform the programs that cost us the most and lead to an unsustainable financial future for the United States, a, a country that will soon be $17.8 trillion in debt that I won't be here to pay back, but my children and my grandchildren will. And you have to ask yourself as a parent, is that fair? And the answer is it's not. Now, instead of doing anything, last year the debt ceiling needed to be increased by $2.1 trillion. And we're about to blow through it. Why? Because we spend a trillion dollars more on an annual basis than what we collect. There is no business, no family, no institution in the world that could spend a trillion dollars more than they collect and be in business. Nor can this country. And the time is running out. And by the way, it's hard to put a calculation on a trillion dollars. What is a trillion dollars? Well, it's 100 percent of the federal investment in K through 12 education. It's 100 percent of the federal investment in higher education. It's 30 percent of the VA budget. 
It's 100 percent of the National Institute of Health. It's 100 percent of the cost of the National Science Foundation. It's 100 percent of the federal partnership with states and localities for infrastructure, bridges, roads, sidewalks. It's 100 percent of our national defense. It's all branches of the military, active in reserve, all bases of the military, domestic and foreign. It comes up to about $942 billion. You want to balance this year's budget, we've got to cut everything I just talked about and find $60 billion more dollars just to balance this year's budget. Well, the takeaway from this is we're not, going to, we're not going to delete our national security. We're not going to decrease our investment in National Institute of Health, National Science Foundation. We're going to be a partner in K through 12 in higher education. There's a lot of places we can cut and we can prioritize and we should be doing it. But the takeaway is you can't get there unless you're willing to reform entitlements. Unless we're willing to look at where the majority of the money is spent, we can't get there. So we've, we've got to do something. And I would tell you it starts with addressing the imbalance that we have in spending and collection right now, not next year. We want him to have the last five minutes. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, Madam President, uh, consistent with this is the Senate still hadn't passed a budget. In fact, the President's own budget didn't receive a single vote in Congress when we voted on it. I shouldn't laugh. We're on track for another year with a trillion dollar deficit. How could, how could any company run an annual, run their company on an annual basis without a budget, without a financial roadmap as to what they do. But now for over a thousand days the United States Senate has not passed a budget. And the law says we've got to do it. That's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. And over the last three and a half years we've added five trillion dollars to the national debt more than in the previous eight years combined and current estimates by the CBO put federal debt at 70 percent of our gross domestic product by the end of this year. We are reaching irreversible levels of debt as it relates to the size of our economy. It is unsustainable and it is dangerous for the fiscal health of our country. The status quo needs to change. Congress needs to address the impending fiscal cliff or risk another downgrade in the coming months. We can accomplish this by passing a budget that moves us towards balance. We can accomplish this by reforming entitlements and pushing band-aids on, not putting band-aids on issues for another time. Our debt will begin to decrease when we put the American people back to work and we get policies in place that encourage the investment of capital. How about something novel? Why don't we reform our tax code? Give me the ability to go to a small business in North Carolina and tell them they're going to pay exactly the same thing GE pays. It's hard for me to explain how they pay 36 percent GE paid nothing. And I'm not faulting GE, don't get me wrong. That's exactly what the tax code currently says. That doesn't make it right. Doesn't mean we have an obligation to leave it like that in the future. I look at it as an opportunity for us to bring equity. But as we bring equity, why don't we bring everybody's obligation, their rates down? It's time for us to reform individual and corporate taxes in America, to do away with loopholes and deductions, to flatten the rates for everybody to broaden the participation by more Americans. You know what? If we do that, we'll be like a magnet for global capital. What's it take to create jobs in the United States? It takes an investment. Reform the tax code. 
flatten the rates, broaden the base. You'll attract capital that will flee to America and create jobs like we've never seen at a time where the world continues to try to figure out how to get out of a hole. We've got an option to do it. I'd like to uh, yield for a second to the... Uh, unanimous consent? Absolutely. I appreciate the Senator. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that Senator Burr have the time until 4.40 p.m. that I be recognized for up to five minutes following the remarks of Senator Burr. Further, that after my remarks, all remaining time be yielded back, the motion to concur with an amendment be withdrawn, and the Senate proceed to vote on adoption of the motion to concur in the House Amendment to S3187. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. I thank the Senator. I, I, I thank the Senator from Iowa. So, you know, I just gave us a recipe for solving our financial, our economic crisis in America. Um, some might say it won't work. Well, I don't know. I think it will. I can tell you this, what we're doing is not working. We're not putting anybody back to work. We're still losing. My state of North Carolina is 9.4 percent unemployment. How, far, how long does it have to continue before we look at it and say this might be a systemic problem? Can we recover from this? How many law school graduates can we look at this year where 60 percent of the class of graduates from the 1st of May, now at the end of June, don't have a job? As a parent, I always thought the toughest thing was to make sure that my kids got in school and that they graduated in four years. Now the greatest burden on a parent is to make sure when they get out they get a job that has a paycheck. And maybe that checks, puts them in a situation where they're self-sustainable. That's not the promise we made to our kids. And that ought to be the driving force behind every adult in this country demanding a change. Because most of our kids did exactly the thing we asked them to stay in school, make good grades, go to college, get a major. You'll be guaranteed a job in an unlimited future. And now the seniors who graduate from college who aren't finding a job, their experience is being questioned by their little brother or sister at home who's struggling to get through high school and wondering why they want to do six more years of education if their older sibling couldn't find a job. Doesn't have to be like this. Doesn't have to be like this. All we have to do is muster up the backbone that we need to pass legislation that creates the atmosphere for capital to be invested in job creation. You know, I'm not rich, but I'm getting tired of us dividing America in as many pieces as you can divide it. Well, we already divided based upon political boundaries, but now we're trying to divide it on everything we can find. Yet, for every politician, when they give that big speech on TV, they boil it down to, this is about Americans. But when you look at the campaign rhetoric that's out there, they slice and dice to try to divide it in as many ways. Let me just assure you, we're not going to solve this if America doesn't solve it. It's not going to be solved in the halls of Congress unless the American people demand it. It's not just one segment of America, it's all segments of America. I talked about de Tocqueville's definition of the greatness of America earlier. He didn't point out some Americans that did it good or did it right. He looked at America as one. As a matter of fact, when you look historically at this country, and I realize I've only got a couple minutes left, I'll be brief. Uh, when the Capitol Dome was torn off and the new construction started, it was because of the wing that we're currently in in the United States Senate and the identical wing that was built on the House side. When those wings were added, architecturally the dome that was on top of the Capitol was out of proportion. And that dome was called a bullfinch dome. And in about 1851, 1852, they started building the dome that we see today made of nine million pounds of cast iron. And as that dome was about a third finished, Abraham Lincoln was president. 
and you could actually watch the Civil War battles across the Potomac on the other side of the river. Then came the end of the war, and Lincoln was president and had every right to be punitive to the South because they lost. Well, I challenge everybody to go back and read Lincoln's speeches after the Civil War. Remember, the first action was to let every Southerner go and keep their gun because he knew they needed to eat. But in every speech that President Lincoln gave after the end of that conflict, where he could have, in, those, in his remarks, been punitive to the South, President Lincoln talked about one nation, one people. Because as the leader of the United States, he understood that his single job was to bring this country back together. And with probably the greatest reason to draw division in America, he refrained from that temptation and he spent all of his time redefining what makes America great. And that's a united country of people. So in the temptation to win elections, in the temptation to show the highlights or successes of one party over the other, I'll conclude with this today. We've got a real opportunity, real opportunity as leaders in this country to set by example how we go forward. Let's quit the political divisions. Let's start it with the two presidential candidates. Don't slice and dice America to where it's this group and that group against this group and that group. Let's realize if you want to change the direction of this country, somebody has to stand up and bring America together. My belief is that we need to do it now or there may not be another opportunity. I can look at my good friend Senator Harkin and myself and we're at an age where we're not going to drastically change our future. We've made the bed we're going to sleep in. But for our children and our grandchildren, the impact of what we do can drastically change the opportunities they've got for a lifetime. I'd love to leave this institution believing that we have had an impact that extends prosperity and opportunity for generations to come. But for a majority of the two and a half plus hours I've taken today, if we don't have the backbone to take it on, it's not going to happen. If we don't do it, nobody else will. Let's demand that the leadership that we put in place is willing to show the leadership needed to bring this country back together for a common purpose, and that purpose to be a country of unlimited opportunities where everybody is treated fairly. I thank the President for her attention. I yield the floor. The Senator from Iowa. Madam President, uh, we're about to uh, move to a vote on the uh, FDA reauthorization bill, a bill which I said earlier we've spent more than a year working on in committee. It's had a lot of input from senators on all sides uh, and uh, industry stakeholders, consumer groups, uh, uh, and, and this is the result of a, of a wide collaboration on all these issues. Uh, I just uh, wanted to respond to a couple of things that my friend, and yes, my friend from North Carolina said earlier uh, about uh, the bill and about an, an, the uh, amendment that, uh, that he was uh, concerned about on the track and trace amendment. Uh, the senator from North Carolina talked about speed. He said that we were rushing this through. Well, Madam President, the vote in the Senate was 96 to 1. The House vote was unanimous. 
that doesn't happen if a bill is tried to be rushed through. <laughs> Anybody tries to rush a bill through is not going to get 96 votes in the Senate or a unanimous vote in the House. Now, again, uh, my friend questioned how hard I wrote the question how hard we really tried to get the track and trace provision included in the conference report. Well, uh, I might turn the question around and question how hard the senator from North Carolina and, uh, and the senator from Colorado worked to get this included. Because we've been working on this bill for over a year. And my friend, a good member of the committee, has been very much involved in many aspects of this bill, he and his staff. And so I wonder then why the amendment was dropped on our staff one day before the filing the bill at the midnight hour. Uh, I might also point out that on September the 14th of 2011, our committee had a hearing on this issue, on the supply chain issue. And the record will show that I, the chairman, was the only one to raise the issue of track and trace at that hearing. Two weeks before markup, Senator Burr and Senator Coburn introduced an FDA bill. Our staff, I don't mean just my staff, Senator Enzi's staff and, and my staff worked for two weeks to incorporate elements of this bill into the reauthorization. Now these are elements of the bill introduced two weeks before by the Senator from North Carolina, Senator Burr and Senator Coburn. So our staff spent two weeks trying to incorporate elements into the bill and they did and we did incorporate a lot of elements. I would point out that there was nothing in that bill that mentioned track or trace that was in that bill that was introduced two weeks before. So again, I just say if this was so important, why wasn't it in that bill, in their bill? And if it was so important, why did it wait until Sunday evening at 6.20 p.m. the day before filing when we get the language? So again, who's trying to rush what? Uh, so again, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't <laughs> we did not try to rush anything. But when you get something dropped in your lap 6.20 p.m. the night before the filing, it's hard to build a consensus. And that's what this bill is. We did go to conference on this, but this issue involves a lot of different players. And we just could not get that consensus. So I say to my friend from North Carolina, we are still working on this. We'll work on it in good faith. But you got the state of California, you got the pharmaceutical manufacturers, you got drug stores, you got consumers, you got a lot of people out there that have something to say about this, and we have to build that coalition in order to get a good track and trace bill through. So, Madam President, we are now about to vote on the critical FDA bill, reauthorizing user fees, modernizing FDA's authority in several meaningful and targeted ways addressing the drug shortage problem, streamlining the device approval process, enhancing our global drug supply chain authority, all the while maintaining and improving patient safety. And because this bill will directly benefit patients in the U.S. biomedical industry, it's critically important to the agency, to the industry, and most importantly, to patients that we get this done. I urge my colleagues to vote for final passage, pass this bill, that will be done. It's the same bill that the House passed unanimously, once it's done here, we can send it to the president and get it signed and, and move ahead uh, with a good reauthorization of the Federal, of the federal uh, Food and Drug Administration. And, uh, Under the previous order, the motion to concur with amendment number 2461 is withdrawn. And the